All right, so we're going to go over the last little bit of notes on evolution. So more terms, more ways that evolution can happen specifically. So when we're talking about the origin of a species, we need to define what, in fact, a species is. When we're looking at what a species is, it's any animals that can interbreed with each other and make viable offspring. That is the part that is really, really important because if they're not able to breed with each other and make viable offspring, then they can't propagate the species or make more. Um, sometimes they will have different behaviors. If you look down at the two birds on the bottom, the eastern meadow lark and the western meadow lark, they look extremely similar. But if they're in captivity in the same area, they're not actually going to breed with each other because they, in fact, have different behaviors that disallow breeding. So when we're looking at how these species originate, we have to have isolation of a population. And there are a couple different ways that we can isolate pop populations. We can isolate them geographically, so physically moving one from one place to another or having something happen where the population gets cut in two, or we can reproductively isolate them. So we can make different behaviors, mating seasons, mechanical variations. So these populations are going to evolve independently. So here's where we have two vocab words that we need to um, kind of learn the difference of. So we have allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. Allopatric means other country. So this is isolation that happens when two populations are physically split from each other. So in the example of the, the fish in the fish pond here, we have one pond and maybe there's a drought and in the middle there'd be a sandbar. That sandbar um, be, like rises up, the water sinks down, and then those two groups of fish are separated from each other. So they're able to evolve independently of each other. If we have sim patrick speciation, sim means same. So they're still going to be living in the same area, but something's going to happen where one group is going to kind of diverge off of the other group and they're going to evolve separately while they still live in the same area. So just looking at examples of this in allopatric speciation is when the flow of genes or the migration of genes from point A to point B is disrupted due to some sort of a barrier. So one example that we use quite a bit is in the Grand Canyon, there's the pictures of little squirrels up there. We have two different species of squirrels that look really, really similar, but if we put them into the same habitat, they will never actually breed with each other because they are in fact different species. And they diverge from each other way long time ago and they exist on either side of the Grand Canyon. This happens quite a bit in valleys or rift lines or if a big flood goes through an area and creates that separation. So allopatric speciation is when two organisms physically separate and there's a barrier where they cannot come back together. Sympatric speciation is gene flow that is reduced by some sort of a habitat differentiation or sexual selection. So for an example of this, if we have a mixed orchard with like apples and hawthorns, which are sometimes come like little tiny crab apples, there are some flies that have evolved to only eat the apples, and there are some flies that have evolved to only eat the hawthorns. So they have separated their niche so they can live in the same place, but they just have a different feeding niche. This would be sympatric speciation. Two organisms cannot exist in the same habitat if they have exactly the same niche. So what these animals will do is they will separate themselves and be like, okay, you guys are going to eat these apples and you guys are going to eat whatever fruit this is. They're still living in the same habitat, but they've separated by foodstuffs. So all of the flies that eat apples are kind of always with each other and evolve separately from the flies that only eat hawthorns, where they're always together and they only, um, you know, eat those. So they're always together and they will make more of that particular species. So now with reproductive isolation, we have some reproductive barriers. So down here, we have some kind of silly pictures. We have like a Great Dane and a Chihuahua. It's not gonna work, right? Parts don't quite fit. Um, we can also have barriers that are pre-zygotic and post-zygotic. So pre-zygotic disallows the egg and sperm from ever connecting together. 
post-zygotic is the animals are able to breed or do the copulation, but that zygote is not going to be viable. And when we're talking about pre-zygotic barriers, mating, fertilization is not going to happen. This could be geographic isolation. So here we have flowers in a mountain range. The little pollen from this flower is never going to make it over the mountain to get to that flower. So that is a pre-zygotic barrier. We have geological isolation. So if we have a ground dwelling lizard and a tree dwelling lizard, they're never going to come into contact with each other. So that would be a pre-zygotic barrier. Temporal isolation. So temporal means time. If there are different breeding seasons, they're never going to be fertile at the same time of year. Therefore, they're never going to breed. Behavioral isolation. Even though these two birds look very, very similar, their songs are different. So they're also not going to breed. Mechanical isolation. This is when the parts don't quite fit, right? Great Dane and Chihuahua. And then gametic isolation. So this is when the sperm and the egg cannot actually physically fertilize each other. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Okay. So when we're looking at geographic isolation, that is going to be a physical barrier. Allopatric speciation. A lot of these things kind of mean the same thing. We're going to use the same word because allopatric means separate countries. So one type of prezygotic barrier could be an allopatric barrier. They don't live in the same place. Therefore, they're not going to breed with each other. Ecological isolation, once again, if we have two species of garter snake, my example here, and one lives in water and the other lives on land, they're never going to breed with each other. Lions and tigers as well, they can hybridize. You guys know this. They make ligers, but lions live in Africa and tigers live in India. They're not going to travel all the way over the Himalayan mountains and Sahara Desert just to get to each other in the wild. When we're looking at temporal isolation, these are times that these things are able to breed. So this could be sympatric speciation. They could live in the same habitat. But if we have an eastern spotted skunk and a western spotted skunk, they overlap in their range so they can live in the same place, but they have different breeding times. So the eastern one mates in late winter and the western ones mate in late summer. They're never going to be fertile at the same time, so they're never going to be able to breed. Behavioral isolation. So this is with all those fun courtship rituals. and these guys and all that good stuff. So we're gonna use all of this sexual selection and sometimes this might not be attractive to some other little critters, right? They might look at a deer and be like, mm, that ain't doing it for me, bud. And they're never going to breed with them. The All of these courtship things help to recognize one of the same species. So here we have some cranes, they have specific dances. A lot of bugs have very, very specific songs. Same thing with um, birds as well. In order to identify the same one of their species, they do little courtship displays. It's very cute. Even humans do that, right? School dances, stuff, you guys twerk and whatever, gross. Okay, so mechanical isolation. This could be a type of sympatric speciation. So if these organisms live in the same habitat, then the parts just don't necessarily fit. So even if we're talking about like plants, for instance, sometimes the flowers have really, really distinct appearances that attract very specific pollinators. So some flowers have co-evolved with hummingbirds, as the example here, that only hummingbirds are going to be able to pollinate that particular flower. And the same thing with the flower on the bottom only bees are going to be able to pollinate that specific flower. So a hummingbird isn't going to cross pollinate the red and the pink flower, and neither is a bee. They have very, very specific things that are going to make them attractive to a hummingbird or a bee to help with that pollination. In addition, there are uh, some other mechanical things that aren't quite going to work. For lots and lots of insects, the sex organs of very closely related species don't actually fit together. If they don't fit, it's not going to work. 
Uh, on the bottom there, those are all pictures of penises of damselflies, and they are very species specific. The same thing goes for ducks and a lot of birds where their penises are very specific to the repro tracts of the female of their species. And sometimes they just don't fit, so the sperm and the egg are never going to come in contact with each other. Then we also have gametic isolation. So a sperm and an egg have to join, and there's actually a chemical bound or bind that happens for the sperm to actually enter the egg. And sometimes those chemical signals are different with species, so the sperm cannot actually get inside of the egg because it's like a lock and key receptor, just like an enzyme. And sometimes in some reproductive tracts of certain female organisms, it's a really inhospitable environment. There's a pH balance difference because we need to make sure that we are keeping that tract clean because it is an opening to your body. So sometimes if it's an inhospitable environment to a certain species sperm, the female's repro tract is gonna kill that sperm and it's never going to actually make it to the egg. When we're talking about post-reproduction barriers, so the, these are post-zygotic barriers, they're able to breed, but their offspring ain't quite right. And there are three things that go along with this is reduced hybrid viability. So viability means ability to live, reduced hybrid fertility. So they're going to be able to live, but they don't have fertility and hybrid breakdown. So when we're looking at reduced hybrid viability, the genes of these parent species are going to impair the development of this organism. So there are some species of salamanders, for example, that can interbreed, but most of the hybrids don't have complete development. They're really frail. Their bones aren't quite put together right. They're just not going to make it. If we look at reduced fertility, these are things like mules. So horses have 64 chromosomes and donkeys have 62. Something weird happens and they're actually able to mate with each other and mules have an odd number of chromosomes. And if you remember mitosis and meiosis, that can't really happen. And this is the reason why two mules cannot breed with each other and make an offspring. They differ in their number of chromosomes and they can't actually make viable sperm or viable eggs. And they fail to reproduce normal gametes so therefore they are sterile. And then we also have hybrid breakdown. So the hybrids might be fertile, they might be viable in the first generation, but when they mate that second time, eventually the fertility and viability breaks down. Um, there are quite a few species of plants that this happens to, where if we have rice hybrids, Next generation's really, really great, but then after that, once they start breeding with each other, they start to kind of break down. This is the reason why we need to plant these crops every single year. We can't just rely on like corn seeds falling and replanting themselves because it just doesn't happen. They have a uh, breakdown over time. When we're looking at this as well, we have different rates of speciation that happen. There are two different schools of thought on this. Both of them have been known to happen, which is gradual, gradualism and punctuated equilibrium. So gradualism is kind of when we talked about like microevolution and macroevolution. Microevolution is little tiny changes in allele frequency that eventually can lead to macroevolution or a brand new species. Gradualism is those little tiny, tiny baby steps that eventually can change the allele varieties in our population and make a new species. Whereas punctuated equilibrium are very fast, rapid changes where we have little to no change over a very long period of time and all of a sudden big change. Little to no change over a period of time of big change. And we've actually found evidence of both um, ways that this can happen in the wild. So when we're looking at gradualism, this is divergence over long, long spans of time where we have little baby steps, little baby steps, and we can actually see all of the accumulations of these changes. Punctuated equilibrium is when all of a sudden we just see a huge change. Like we have an animal that has no tail and all of a sudden, bam, they all have tails, okay? They undergo rapid change 
when they first break off from that parent population. Um, this can actually happen due to rapid adaptation due to climate change or a severe natural disaster and filling new open niches in an area. So just once again, a little bit of a review with all of this stuff. Post-zygotic isolation, these are things like hybrid inviability. So this can cause abortions or birth defects, hybrid sterility, so not fertile, hybrid breakdown, where as we go on and keep interbreeding, their viability breaks down over time. Review again, gradual versus really, really fast. Gradualism is slow little changes. Punctuated equilibrium is fast changes due to major environmental disruption. Okay, so keep all these things in mind. We have a couple last vocab words. Stick with me, guys. So divergent versus convergent. To diverge means to split from each other. So if we think about like Darwin's finches and adaptive radiation, we had one original finch go to those islands. There were a bunch of open niches because there were no birds on that island that filled any of those roles. So those birds spread out and did very, very well and adapted over time and evolved to fill those different environmental niches. Convergent evolution, to converge means to come together. It's kind of a misnomer, and in my opinion, it's kind of like a confusing way to say it, but convergent evolution is when we have analogous structures. So if we remember our evidences of evolution and analogous structures, I always think about wings on animals. So bat wings have bones in them, bird wings have bones, insect wings are just made of chitin. They all have wings because they all need to be able to fly, but their wings did not come from a common ancestor. That is what convergent evolution is. So if we look at sharks versus dolphins, a shark is a fish and a dolphin's a mammal. However, their body shape is very, very similar because they have to be able to do the same job with that phenotype. So when we're looking at adaptive radiation, this is a type of divergent evolution where we have one species branching into many, 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 many species. To radiate means center point, radiate, going all over the place. And they're doing it because they're adapting to that new environment. Coevolution, I touched on before when we talked about the um, breeding of those different flowers and only hummingbirds pollinate some and only bees pollinate the other ones. Coevolution is when two or more species kind of work together over time in, ordering, in order to survive. This can happen with species that are competitors of each other. This can happen in mutualism. So we have pollinators and the flowers that go with them. This can be a predator-prey relationship. So if we think about like a disease and a host species where some diseases are very, very specific or some parasites are very specific to the animals that they infect, that is all examples of coevolution. is two species that affect each other's changes in evolution. And that is it. Those are all the vocab words. So make sure to go take your quiz about this and all of that good stuff.